Let's do a Chaim and then Aaron, my good friend, is going to make an introduction really quick and then we're going to start. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay, everybody, I want to say that this moment should be a year where all of the difficulties and trials and tribulations of our life, both personal, family, economic, collective as a family, it's called Yisrael in the world, should flip around and all turn to good. And just as difficult as this year, it should be sweet the opposite. Rabbi Nachman Abrahman says, there's a way that Hashem can make everything turn sweet. And this year, uh, this past year was very, very difficult for a lot of people on many levels. And uh, Hashem's help is going to be the sweetest year. We all have in our lives uh, on every level. And uh, I just want to say, Chaim, thank you for having me here. I feel so honored and, and appreciative to, to let me come to your home to speak. And I hope, as with Hashem, it's something that connects you and, and it should bring you much closer to Hashem after the time it's over. Amen. 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 It's, uh, it's a strange thing what we're doing in Chicago and Detroit um, in the midst of a pandemic and especially you know for myself when I went to one of the Machons and uh, where um, Marie Nachman was not necessarily spoken so much about um, and in this, in, in sort of a great twist of faith, I married into a family where, um, where there's Rabbi W. Solkamis, who is trying to do something which in my own eyes is revolutionary and in my own heart is totally changed my Avodah Hashem in the time that I've, in the time that I've known him. Um, and I think the reason why we're on this trip, we're going to Detroit, we're going to Chicago, is because, and I believe this with tremendous conviction, that what, what, what David has to offer the world is something that could really heal people. Um, Torah that's panemius, Torah that's based on the deepest sources, but relatable in the most profound ways to every person. And... Um, and when he asked me to go on this trip with him, it was definitely a, a big merit. And uh, just we unexpectedly, Rav David spent, took us with us. And he spent a week in Highland Park, basically. And I cannot even tell you the ripple effect that it's had on people's lives. People really talking about Amuna, the guys in the, the guys in the Chabura who are, you know, really trying to not just die, but really become the Nehemiah. And uh, we just recently started, sort of inspired by the by the by something that the piece that the Rebbe wrote, uh, the name of Shabbatova, that we have our own now, Vuk Hashem, the name of Shabbatova in Highland Park, with a few guys, about 10, 11 guys. And the idea is, Mom is just to be simple work on the word of Hashem, Amun, talking to Hashem, learning in a in a in a, in a powerful way, um, really transforming our consciousness as much as we can, and. Uh, and with that experience and the heels of that experience, we're here. And we're very inspired. And uh, we're hoping that, uh, that what David will share will also be inspiring. He recently opened Sion Breslov, which is a not for profit organization, which is literally its goal is to get these teachings as far and wide as possible. He's getting international attention from, from people across the world for these classes. Um, he, he wants nothing for himself. He wants only Manish to heal people through these colors. And uh, we're always looking for support, if, any, any type of support. We're looking, we have sort of a big vision of pulling together people in the, in the mental health world that uh, it's sort of creating a, a cadre of uh, mental health professionals that could use these teachings to go out and, and help heal people. It's like obviously very at the beginning, yeah, but we spoke to someone today actually. Uh, you know, one of someone, alumnus of Mahan Shlomo was interested in getting involved in that way. Um, and, um, you know, just big things over here. So we're looking for any type of help, talent, resources, financial help, anything to help us, you know, get this, you know, message across um, that can really save people's lives. So without further ado. Thank you, guys. Aaron. So, um, so just before I start telling you the story, I just want to introduce myself. I'm not a normative rabbi. Uh, I grew up. Uh, completely secular. I didn't know what the Philanus about was growing up um, until I was 24 years old. Where is that? I was born in uh, Queens, but I grew up in New Jersey. 
And um, I was actually, uh, from the time I got to middle school, I became uh, an atheist. And I increased and I, I became as religious about that as I am now with Judaism. Um, to the extent that I was probably doing the opposite of what I'm doing now. And then Hashem uh, gave me a tremendous revelation that he's real. And that the reason that I am the way I am is because I'm Jewish. And, um, and then I realized my whole life was going to change because I wasn't an atheist, but Dafka because I wanted to go against something. I was actually searching for the truth and I found nothing. And, uh, and I just saw a lot of a world full of suffering and, and, and hatred and, and jealousy and anger. And I didn't understand why we were like that. The only thing that could explain that to me was evolutionary theory. So, um, but the Shem, uh, through a, a series of really, really malament of experiences, some of them drug induced, some of them, uh, some of them by going to Eretz Israel for the first time and having, uh, very, 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 in, looking back, completely, you know, Yad Hashem, something that you can't even fathom. Um, that Hashem made me realize that He's real. So I'm coming from that place, and and therefore um, I don't like give schmoozes. I don't uh, give like normal divrei Torah. I don't know exactly how this fits into the spectrum of like Torah lesson. So I hope you'll be like open to something maybe a little bit different. Um, I went to school to become a mental health therapist. I went to undergraduate psychology and ultimately uh, I was actually seeing my own therapist at the time. And, um, and I told him that I wanted to be a therapist and go get my PsyD or my PhD. And after telling him why I want to do that, he said, I don't really think you want to be a psychiatrist. I think you want to be a social worker. And so I started to look into social work. I didn't ever even heard of the profession. And I saw that the mission statement was to advocate for those who are oppressed, to lift up those who are poor, to bring justice to those who are, uh, you know, on the outskirts of society and those who are mitigated. And I couldn't believe it was an actual profession. <laughs> the, uh, the only issue uh, for my family was that, um, was that they make like, you know, very little amount of money for the year. And after going to school for so many years and they felt that I could do so much with it, they were very uh, shocked to hear that I was going to go for social work. Um, but thank God I did. And I went to UCLA for graduate school and I got a lot of experience there working in substance abuse groups, leading uh, mental health therapy, um, individual sessions, group sessions, substance abuse, personality disorders, depression, anxiety, the whole gamut of mental health. <laughs> and while that whole thing was going on, I, I was starting to wear a kippa that was like about this big. And, uh, and uh, in my journey, you know, back to Hashem. And when I left there, um, I was really searching for something within Torah that connected to me, that, that created within me a feeling of wholeness, of hope, of yearning, of, of truth, something that I can run after my whole life, something that was real, something I've been searching for my whole life within the Torah. And I found uh, a spiritual master, his name is Rabbi Nachman of Breslau. And even though uh, amidst the traditional Jewish world, uh, his whole movement is very threatening to people because it's kind of shifted off into a lot of directions. Some of those directions are not necessarily rooted in what Rabbi Nachman was talking about. And as a result of that, they're very scared to send people to Breslau Mashpias and to learn Rabbi Nachman's Torah. When in truth, anybody who's ever looked at Rabbi Nachman's Torah uh, I've never heard a person say this is not Emmet Lamito, this is not the truth of truths, and that uh, it's not completely rooted in Torah and every aspect of it. It's just the highest level of it. Um, and after my experience with psychology, both in the professional world and also with myself, that I struggled so much with depressive episodes growing up and anxiety, uh, crippling anxiety, um, and not medicine and not psychiatry and not psychology and not therapy helping me. And... Uh, and then Rabbi Nachman came into my life. And I learned something about Amuna. And I learned something about Hibodadu. And I learned something about praying with koach, with power. And I learned something about being simple and to stop being sophisticated and to trust Hashem that Hashem is going to take care of you instead of you trying to make all of these different devices and uh, imaginations in order to be able to achieve your goals in life. And slowly but surely as I was working on this, I started to get very, very close to Hashem and I started to heal. 
from things which psychiatrists and psychologists say is, is, is genetic and is impossible to heal from. And as a result of that, once I did so and I started that journey, I told Hashem, if you ever heal me, I, I'm going to go spend the rest of my life uh, trying to help everybody that I possibly can. Um, a lot of people don't understand why I'm here if I'm not like making any money or I'm not, you know, why, I'm, why do I leave my family for a week? Like, if I teach like four or three or five, six people in random cities. And um, when you really know that you're holding on to Geula, um, then there's nothing more important in the world. There's a rabbi, my, reb, my rebbe, Rabbi Walken, who passed away in the Shemesh of Evan Aliyah. Um, his rabbi, Rabelski, he used to uh, teach very fundamental, basic Torah to people on the radio station. And his students used to ask him, you're like the guttle of door. Your mom is like holding in every aspect of the Torah, not just in, in learning, but in teaching and everything. You could be helping and teaching so many people at such a high level. Why are you taking time during the week to go on a radio station and teach something that someone else could? And his answer was that when you care, you don't care. And this is a very real statement and this is a very profound statement. That after I went through all of my psychiatric uh, issues, my psychological issues, to get to a point that's so low, that's unfathomable, that's unspeakable. Um, if you get out of that, you realize what's important in life. And you kind of stop caring about everything else, like becoming rich, like people honoring you, um, like achieving some type of capitalistic goal. But instead, uh, just to try and give over people something that can really draw them closer to Hashem, closer to the Torah, closer to their true selves. So this is kind of a little bit of a very short background on me, just to try to get you familiar with me. We're on parts of Bereshit. L'chaim. to this. The brand new year. L'chaim, L'chaim, L'chaim. Mama says it should be L'chaim. Does that the that the Shua should bring us L'chaim? I mean, Trevi Nachman says it's Simcha. That's the expression, how do you know you're alive if you're happy? If you're happy, you know, clap your hands. But if, you, if, you, if you're happy, it means that you're alive. And that's the real sort of why the Gemara says that the Dikim are alive even when they're not here, and that Rashaim are dead even when they're here. Because the Tzaddik is actually, he lives with his Amunah, like it says in Kazal. So to the degree that a person has Amunah, to that degree he's happy. And to the degree that a person doesn't, to that degree he's unhappy. And that's why a Tzaddik is alive when he's here and when he's not here. And a Rasha, meaning a person who doesn't have Amunah, he's not alive even when he's here, meaning he's unhappy. Oh, so we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about this. Very good. Rabbi Nachman used to say that to the degree that you, uh, everything in your life is hard, whether it's at work or with your family or in the vote of the Shem, spiritually, physically, whatever, that things are just, everything weighs on you. It's like a mountain. It's hard, which we can all relate to. Rabbi Nachman says, it's to the degree that you lack a Muna, you feel that. And to the degree that you have a Muna, to that degree, you don't feel the weight of the things that you're doing, even if they are difficult. And Rav Natan, his main student, was very troubled by this because he had been learning by Rabbi Nachman for years. And he felt, if anything else, I got a Muna. But he said to Rabbi Nachman, in an unusual way to speak to your Rebbe, he said, what, I don't have a Muna? I don't believe in Hashem. I believe in Hashem. Why is everything so hard in my life? And he told him, you're right, but you don't believe in yourself. And Rabbi Nachman teaches that there is no way to believe in Hashem without believing in yourself. And Rav Natan brings down that there's four levels of Amunah to negate the four letters of Hashem's name. And that is the Yud, which is that you believe in Hashem 100%. That is the Hey, that is you believe in His uh, Torah 100%. That is the vav that you believe in truth of deeping, 100%. And that is the final head that you believe in your health, self, 100%. And it's very clear, and Rabbi Nachman, in his prophetic way, said that in the final generation, the pagam that we would have would be greatest in belief in yourself, not in the other one. That many of us are constantly feeling, okay, I believe in Hashem, I'm living with Torah, I'm living with this, I'm living with that, but everything in our life is so brutally hard, 
and we don't understand why. And the reason is very, very simple and very deep because you don't believe in yourself. And usually when you learn Torah, it's very self-deprecating. When you learn Musar, you come out feeling like, okay, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. So there is no place for belief in yourself. And Rabbi Nachman doesn't say it's a good thing to believe in yourself. He doesn't say it's an amazing thing to believe in yourself. He says it's mamish essential. And if you do not believe in yourself, you can never really believe in Hashem. So now we're going to speak about a topic that is connected to this, which is seemingly not related. And uh, it was not what I was planning on speaking about, but I had a, a ruach from Hashem. And I hope that this is what you guys need. That Bereshi Barlo came at the Shemayim that the Aris, that Rabbi Nachman teaches that this first Pasuk in the Torah, why, like Rashi says, why are we learning about this in the beginning of the Torah? Start with the first mitzvah. And Rabbi Nachman teaches based on the Zohar that this whole first Pasuk is to teach you how to create your own world. Because every person is an own katan. Every person is a miniature world. We don't really need to know Hashem created the world because this thing is way above our understanding that even if we wanted to sit and think about it, we couldn't actually understand. So then why is he explaining in the beginning of the Torah how he created the world if we couldn't even hop it even if we thought about it all, all of our life? And the answer is because Hashem is trying to teach you how to create your world, how to create a new world for yourself. What does a new world mean? No sadness, no anxiety, life force, joy, excitement. The moon. That's a new world. How do I know it's a new world? Because our world is not like that. We're always sad. We're always worried. And if somebody asks you, what are you missing? So you're going to have these very lofty goals that you say you're missing. But what do you have? Your clothes are on you. You always have food to eat. You always have drinks to drink. Many of us are married have children, that for thousands of years, people only lived for these things, and they couldn't even get food or drink with a tremendous struggle all year. We have food in front of us that took a year to make, and we eat it like it's nothing, and we sit in our homes and we cry, why, Hashem, are you not helping me? Why are you not with me? And for thousands of years, if they saw our life, they would give up everything to have it. So why is it that we're so sad, that we're so anxious? That the prophet Yeshaya says in the final generation, there won't be a famine of food. There won't be a famine of drink. We're going to be missing Devar Hashem. Not that you're going to be yearning for it. You're going to be yearning for money. You're going to be yearning for esteem. You're going to be yearning for individual success. But what will you be missing is Devar Hashem. Torah, Emuna. Why is it that in a country that has the most things, if you've ever been anywhere else, I was in third world countries, they mamish have nothing. Their food is covered in flies. They don't have hot water. They're always dirty. And they're happy. And we are sitting in America with the nicest clothes, with the greatest food, that it's right next door. I could just go next door. We have everything at our fingertips and we're the saddest people in the whole world. How does that make any sense? Anybody want to ask? Oftentimes in life, more does not equal happiness. More means more. And more can mean more anxiety. It just means more separate. Not separate. More doesn't equal happiness. It's like shock. I mean, like, if we have more, therefore we have more stress, we have more anxiety, more depression, we have more. We're not, a, we're not someone who's happier because you have more. We're, someone, we're a society that has more. So why are you running after it? Not you. But why, why are we running after it? Because you also brought up a society that teaches more equals happiness. Good. Anybody else want to say? 
Yeah, I was gonna say. I mean, there's a great quote you once said: "No money, no problem." <laughs> right. Is, is that name Biggie Small? Yeah, I think that's <laughs> notorious. Um, yeah. No, but like, so. It's I actually, I, it's, it's so funny because I tell my students that he was not the first one to have this kiddush. It was Rabbi Nachman. But go ahead. <laughs> I was like, I was actually quoting Rabbi Nachman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, no, 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 it's cool. It's cool. No, 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 it's good. It's good. It's good. Um, no, but I think I think it's all about perspective, right? Like you were saying, like what society tells us equal well, happiness is material possessions, but we soon find out that as we acquire these things, we actually don't get any happy. So we're like, what what's going on here? I have all these things, but I'm not happy. Beautiful. I just need to get more of them because look at these other people. They seem so happy. Beautiful. You can be extremely happy. I think we live in a world that wants wants to have everything you they they need to have everything they want but happiness is wanting everything you have and that's really what the society that we're missing is, is that we have so much to make us happy we're not choosing happiness good how about you guys you feel comfortable talking <laughs> anyway, no. we're well, so happy as <laughs> come on no, I I mean, food 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 everything taken care of yeah. Yeah. everything is like you said you have we have plenty of food on the table we have electricity, we have running water. And so all of our basic needs are, are cared for. So that forces us to actually spend time thinking, thinking about ourselves, thinking about the people around us. And when we spend some time with ourselves, we don't like what we see. Right. You know, we don't, we're, we judge ourselves harder then we judge other people and you know because we don't really like ourselves because we judge ourselves unfavorably that leads us to self-deprecation which can lead to depression which can lead to a number of of things that that you know these icd-10 codes that we get diagnosed with right. but maybe necessarily don't mean what don't you know isn't what, what's really going on inside beautiful how about you uh all, all i all that's coming to mind right now is is one of our good or is a uh, friend working very close to Val. i think uh say that that tone is is good so my mode is that oh, oh. <laughs> good that's all okay very good <laughs> so, so I want to tell you something interesting because Rabbi Nachman doesn't say it's a lack of money that's the cause of our problem. I mean, sorry, it's not. It's not the fact that we're running after it, or it's not the fact that we have so much. It's the fact that we don't have en enough so that we can go think. So, in fact, the Shem is actually giving us almost a preemptive state of Geula that you do have what you need. The issue is that we don't have the other part, which is the spiritual part. It's called Da'at, God consciousness. And that's why we don't like what we see. So I want to tell you a, a very important teaching that changed my life. Something that Rabbi Nachman stressed, and I can say this with almost complete assurity, more than anybody, any tzaddik who ever lived, even the Hasidic masters. And that's the concept of the Brit. That's the concept of the of the Brit. Now, obviously, as a secular person growing up, to go away seated is as normal as eating breakfast in the morning. And um, to come into a world, I remember even when they were doing Hebrew Bible, and I opened up and I saw that it, it's not okay. They told me to close the book. You're not ready for that. So let's say you even are ready for that. What would stop you from actually pursuing it when you're so sad? when you're so anxious. It's instant relief. So to strengthen the question, the Arizal says that the entire exile of Tal Yisrael in Mitzrayim, which is a microcosm of our exile for all of history, is in order to rectify the Brit. And Rabbi Nachman, in almost every single Torah that he does, he discusses the Brit, sexual purity, which is the complete antithesis to society. And that this is the key to making money easily. This is the key to Simcha. This is the key to Amuna. This is the key to experiencing God consciousness. The birth is the key to everything. And for this reason, he's constantly speaking about it. Where do we see 
explicit in the Torah that this is so ichor. Yosef, I want to go earlier. I want to go earlier. Yeah. I want to go earlier. I want to go earlier. Not that early. I <laughs> know you're doing good. But it's in what you said, but let's go to the first word of the tour. Gracious. Zohar teaches that it's a uh, it is a permutation of the word Brit Aish. So the very first word in the entire Torah is centered on the word Brit. The Brit of fire. Why is it called the Brit Aish? Because when a person has a sexual desire, you'll notice that he completely, his mind shuts off. And he's willing to do anything in order to... The reason the Zohar called the Brit Mayim, it's, a, it's actually Taivas is Mayim. Right? Taivas is Mayim. It's also Aish. Aish is referring to the Brisbane of the sun. So the Gemara speaks explicitly about how the, how the Brit is also Aish. And how it, it fills you, even though the desire is like water, the experience in your body is like fire. Because you're not able to actually function once it happens. I give this example all the time, that you have a person, uh, who is the president of the United States, who on paper, he achieves like the highest dream in the first country. In the, in, in, your mom is like the king of the world, so to speak. Lahavdil. And you give the whole thing up for your fat secretary. <laughs> And that on paper doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it really doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it's not logical. How does that happen? <laughs> that you work your whole entire life for something and you actually achieve it and you give it all up <laughs> for that. Ruach <laughs> Stud, very good. Once you are you the Ruach Stut fills you this desire for that your whole entire Moach your mind shuts down and you can't think of it and you can literally give up everything for it. that's on a very very uh, we'll say extreme level but let's say on a more subtle level that we constantly are looking at women or thinking about women and it's not over and we're not necessarily falling all the way, meaning we're not with our fat secretary. But we are fantasizing or we are uh, acting in private. So why is the Torah start with Brit Aish? To show you that the beginning of a new world starts with the Brit. Literally. Literally. The Brit is Gematria 612. You add the Kola, 613. Can they get all the mitzvot? If you look at the Torah, it's Gematria 611. You add the Kola, it's the Brit. So you see that the Brit is very, very fundamental. And in a sense, to keep the Brit is actually keeping the whole Torah. Now, I had a conversation with my best friend growing up recently. And he's completely secular. He lives in Eretz Israel. He lives in Tel Aviv. Or he did live in Tel Aviv, just moved. And because of my influence, he is a very strong atheist at this point, unfortunately. We didn't, we had kind of like didn't speak, not because we don't love each other. At least he's thinking. Not because we don't connect, but because it's hard for us to find common ground to speak about. It's just, you could see that he speaks about something and I'm silent. I speak about something and he's quiet. And it's just weird and it pains me so much because I love him so much and he loves me so much. He's literally our brother. But when he had the birth of his first son and he called him Adam, so I went crazy, giving him drush after drush about Adam and Risho and Gematrias and Kabbalah and Zohar and Hasidus, you know, and Adam. And he listened to me for like a half an hour. I thought this would be like a way for me to enter into the world of something I can relate to because when you name your son something, it's so meaningful to you. And I just kept talking and talking. I don't know. It was probably like a half an hour. And he said to me, David, I want to tell you something unbelievable. I'm like shocked 
And I thought like I hit something. That he he like something hit and I got so excited. And he said, not even about what you spoke about, <laughs> which is awesome, but just the fact that you know so much about anything <laughs> is, is 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 like is is like is rocking my mind. That you just are continue to rattle off facts about something is insane. Now I was diagnosed with a learning disability when I was young. And it's very hard for me to learn. How is it that I, I learn in the Kolel? And I'm learning all day and night. I do this every day with Hashem's help. When on paper, the last thing that I should be doing as a profession is to learn professionally. And this I can't explain to, to my friend when he asked me this. But the answer is very clear in Rabbi Nachman's Chassidus. And that is that the key to experiencing your God consciousness is through your breath. Now, why is that? What is the first mitzvah of a person, of a man? Right? What day is that on? Eighth day. Why is it on the eighth day? So seven is complete. One above the thing. Eight is transcendent. Flip the eight sideways. Eight represents transcendence above this physical world. Six represents the physical world. Seven represents the perfection of the physical world. Why do we do it on the eighth day when, in fact, the Brit is the most physical thing in the world? I'm working on having this level of purity in the Brit, and it's mom is the most physical part of my body, and yet we do that on the eighth day. And the reason is very, very deep. The key to transcendence above physicality and by the way physicality is the cause for sadness it's the cause for anxiety it's the cause for lack of life force so therefore the key to simcha to joy the key to life force which is not found in this world because physicality is dead spirituality is alive the key to all of this is to transcend the physical world how do you transcend the physical world you do it by accessing eight the eighth day the breath now Simply, the Brit just means that you don't waste seed. This on the paper is already hard enough. Rabbi Nachman says the hardest test for every man for his whole entire lifetime will be Shmir at the Brit. No matter what he struggles with, whether it's anger, whether it's jealousy, whether it's sadness, whether it's lack of faith, whatever it is, he says explicitly, every man's greatest test in his lifetime will always be the Brit. Okay? So therefore, if you struggle with it, you're in good company. And there's nothing wrong with you because of that. However, it doesn't change the fact that your ability to enter into Da'a, to ex experience God consciousness, which is the key to joy, which is the key to unity, which is the key to a connection, which is the key to excitement, really the key to everything you're looking for in your life, to a new Bria, to Makadish yourself, to recreate yourself, is through something which is so physical, which is the breath. And let's say I don't waste seed. So then why am I still sad? Why am I still angry? Why am I still confused if that's really the key? And the answer is that the Brit is very far reaching. In Kabbalah, the Brit is called the Tzaddik. What is the point of having a Tzaddik in your life? What's the point of having a rabbi, a rabbi? What do you want to say? Take it up to higher levels. Take it to higher level. To be your foundation. To be your foundation. Okay. I was going to say to, to guide you on your path. Guide you on your path for life. Same. Add one. Um, <laughs> that's totally Give you direction. <laughs> give you direction. Okay. Why is he able to do that? And why do you need him for that? Why don't you just do that? You lived in your whole body, your whole life. You know all of your experiences. You know your wants. You know your weaknesses. You know your desires. Why make yourself a ready? Why find the tzaddik? The real answer is there's something better than for us. Why did we do that? Because we live in a world of yesh. Yeah. We need to have fitzel, especially fitzel to das Torah. Why does he have Moshe Rabbeinu? And why does he have das Torah? If you learned as much as he did, would you have das Torah? If I learned every every person needs a rebbe, because a rebbe is a conduit to accessing the tzaddik inside himself. When Benachman speaks about a tzaddik throughout the whole time, 
he's not talking to the tzaddik. And when he says I need tzaddik, he's saying that we can all say I need tzaddik. When That's he's true. talking about a tzaddik, he's talking about that we all have a tzaddik inside of us. That's one level. So if you have an access to a rebbe, it also is a reflective and it's a the therapeutic process of having a relationship where it's a say the charav. What you're doing is when you have a rebbe, you are accessing. Your potential. Yeah, saying, I'll say you lecha, make yourself. Yeah, around. he's saying that when you have one, the reason why you need to have one is to show you what you can become. Very good. And how does he show you that? Like, like he had the exact same struggles and he overcame. And what did he I'm overcome? I'm not really overcame. Whatever. I'm pretty sure Rabbi Jorsey didn't have the same struggles. <laughs> what, what, what is it that's giving him da to be able to guide you through a thing? <laughs> how do I know that? How do you know that what? How do we know that's a fact? And that's not a theory. That it's his level of the Brit that gives him the die to be able to guide you in your life to you becoming a Tzad. It's Tzadik Yisod Olam. Yisod is from the source of Yisod, which is connected to Bris, which is, you know, Rabbi Nachman was uh, on the same Ushpizen as Yosef Tzadik and Bris, and he speaks about the Bris, he speaks about Tzadik, he speaks about Russia, he wrote the whole concept of where they're up in and look for connect. It's the whole concept of bringing Mashiach. They all know that bris is, is, is it's the most physical, but it's also the most spiritual. It's creating a new life. Very good. But I, I, I do think that why it's Sadiq is able to, why you're saying sh- what it's representing, what the bris represents is the highest level of elevating physical and the spiritual. Beautiful. You got it. 100%. So you, take, you take the most physical act and you mm-hmm. elevate it. This is the hardest thing in the world to do. How Kodesh many? Was that? It's Kodeshin to you. How much of us, we have trouble even eating in a way that's not like an animal? This is one of my greatest tests. Mamish, I had an easier time with the bird than that. They say that time of bird comes from Akiva. I know that. And they also say that time of the Akiva comes from and and by the way, the Zohar says that makes sense. the Zohar says explicitly. Adam slept with all the animals. There you go. So, so, so the Zohar says explicitly. They have a question. I don't understand. The Pusik says that the Klali says Kulam Sadiki. Is that true though? The Zohar says. Is it true? Is it, I mean, it's a nice thing to say. It's beautiful. It's very empowering. But do you see that every single Jew is Mamish Tzadik? That is. He's a tzaddik in the merit of the fact that he has the brit. The Zohar says explicitly that you have a tzaddik inside of you. Every Jew has a kulam tzaddikim. And your ability to tap into that is your ability to tap into the brit. Rabbi Nachman says explicitly in the Quran that you have a point of Mashiach inside of yourself. And for your ability to bring that redeemer out of yourself is completely contingent on the level of your brit. A lot of brit stuff. A lot of Brit stuff. Okay. So great. So it looks like this is pretty important. So let's say no matter where you're holding. So why am I still struggling? Somebody asked me this past week when I was in New Jersey. Let's say I don't waste seed. So why am I still sad? Why am I still anxious? Why am I still confused? Because the Brit is all encompassing. What does the Brit mean? The Brit means, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and make it as simple as possible. The physical world is a means to an end. Whenever, and I know it's going to sound intense, but I'm, I, I want it to, I'm going to try and de-intensify it, but I just want to give it like simple, 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 so you can live with it. The Brit is that you use the physical world for spiritual means. But you use the physical means for a spiritual end. That when I eat, it's in order to get closer to Hashem. That means that you're Shmir the Brit. When I am in, obviously, the act of sexuality, I'm using it in order to achieve spiritual ecstasy. That's Shmir the Brit. That when I go to make money, I'm not doing it in order to have money, but I'm, or I'm doing it for a spiritual goal that is to give tzedakah. I'm going to make a bracha. What do you mean? Where you be? I just make a bracha. If it's so spiritual, that's the essence of it. Why don't you make a bracha? Everything that we see that is as the elevation of physical and the spiritual, if that's the epitome of what Hashem created, why don't you make a bracha? Because it's 
the Brit me laugh anything. It's supposed to be that of translating that title into speech. It's a great question. I want to give you my intuition and then I have to go look into it. My intuition is that your wife wouldn't like that. Maybe if you're if you're truly unified and no. she's on a no. level. No. <laughs> no. A bracha together? No. No. I know it. No. Uh, no woman that I know likes not that I know so many women. <laughs> But in my experience, the thing that a woman hates the most is that what you're doing with her is calculated and it's for a reason. And it's not simply because you love her and you're thinking about her. Right. But at the same time, it's also... I, I understand it, that there's it, more to it. It's a therapeutic process of that. This is the purpose of all creation. I, I get that. I get that. But what I'm saying is that the, the Brit is so far reaching that it's not a one-time act. And this is the reason why people struggle so much with the Brit. And they wonder why, if I'm not masturbating, am I still these things? If Rabbi Nachman says that if I'm shmir with the Brit, I'm going to make money very easily. That if I'm shmir with the Brit, I'm going to be happy. But I'm not doing those things and I'm shmir with the Brit. And the answer is because you're not shmir with the Brit. Because the Brit is not just wasting seed physically. It's not wasting any seed. What is seed? It's spiritual potential. At every moment, you have potential to actualize spirituality. <laughs> Right now, we're together. We are literally mamish eating in order so that we should be happy while we're learning Torah. That means that you're rectifying the bread. We're using our mouths, which we could be using for anything, which is physical, and we're using it to speak Torah. We're rectifying the bread. You're looking at me as I'm teaching you Torah. You are rectifying the bread in regards to your eyes. You're hearing the Torah that's coming out of the mouth. You're rectifying your ears. And all of this is connected to the bread. What you see, what you hear, what you think about is all related to the birth. What's the answer to my friend's question of how I'm able to know so much about something when I have a learning disability and it was a possibility for me to understand anything growing up? And the answer is that part of my learning disability came from the fact that I was wasting seed at every possible moment that I could. More than anybody that I I know this is on camera and I just I have to tell you just because I love you and I care about you and I and I and I and I need to be honest with you. Your ability to access consciousness is dependent on the birth. Meaning what? That you take the physical world and you lift it up. Why is it that in Shabbat we take the cup? Why don't we just do bracha like this? Why do we go like this? Why do we go like this? The gematria, of the, the gematria of the word kos is 86. 86 is gematria Elohim. Elohim represents nature, the physical world, the tether. You take the cup and you lift it up. And then you take, say, Adal. Then you say, Shabbat. Why? Because the whole leaving the physical world and moving into the state of Shabbat, that you don't have to worry about money, that you don't have to worry about your physical needs, that you don't have to worry Islam at all, is dependent on you lifting up that cup. And when you lift up that cup and you drink it, it's not. But if you were to do it sitting down here, it would cause you tremendous anguish. I created an organization. You tell me on paper. If you create an organization and you're learning in Kolel and you're teaching Torah at night and you create a brand new organization and you leave your job behind and now your family's income is dependent on the organization working out, what would you spend a lot of time doing? Be honest. I'm, 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 I, this wasn't taped. This is how I, I I am not even focused on this. I'm having a real conversation with my brother. No, I was on that level. Not even on that level. Did no level. I was on level. I'm first of all, you should know I'm on, I'm on I'm on no level. This you should know. You should know that I'm on no level to start an organization, and this is the point of why I'm saying this. I am on not a level to start an organization, but I did it anyway. So now I'm asking you, if anybody starts an organization and your family, it's your focus. It's your focus. How much would you focus on that? 100. percent You would you would learn less, no? Would, if if you le if you learned in Kola and you spent eight hours learning, I would find a core group of funders <laughs> to give me time to balance. But you would have to go, fundraising and, and learning. But you would have to go look for that. I wouldn't. I would start it with those. With those. How did you get before you? 
And let's say I didn't, let's say I didn't wait. And I just started because Rabbi Nachman says Hayom today. Start now. Okay. So now, so now, now what would you do? Any person is, is, if he's honest, is going to say, I would devote all my attention to every aspect of the organization. Whether it's in meetings, whether it's setting up the structure, whether it's setting up the vision, whether it's getting resources and funding. I didn't change my Seder at all. Well, that's the fundamental aspect of your organization, right? It's part of the yeah, but, but, but I'm explaining that. Why, why am I not doing it? Because Rabbi Nachman teaches that the success of what you do on a physical level is dependent on your spirit of birth. And, and, and there's been malam in a teva since we started. It has nothing to do with me. I'm not the smartest person in the world. I'm not the most anything in the world. Nothing. Mamish. You're probably all better than me in every way. <laughs> you think so? I just love your money. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Ready? Put the hat somewhere else. This is a misrepresentation of me. This is a misrepresentation of me. This has nothing to do with me. I am just like you, except I wear a white shirt. There's no difference. There's no difference. I will put it on the table that I suffered worse anxiety, worse sadness than you, worse taiva than everything. Everything. I've heard from my students for years now what they're going through. It doesn't even taste what I've been through. And what is the key? His name is the tzaddik. You need a tzaddik in your life, not just a rabbi to guide you. I tell you this for absolute sure. I went to Uman this past year, and I know people around me that literally went from the street that on paper they look for a life of complete unsuccess in every single way, physically, mentally, psychologically, emotionally, and they are giving chiyuf and amuna to their whole community. How is that possible that Gadalia Fenster has a gambling uh, addiction, and now he's mamish giving chizik to the whole world? How is it possible that people who are motorcyclists and drug addicts are now literally giving a muna to those who have been living their whole life? <laughs> Nothing's wrong with motorcycles. <laughs> except for the fact that they're sore. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> How does that happen? The only honest answer is, and I'm telling you this honestly, there's a concept called the Tzadik Emi. In Kabbalah, he's called the Yesod. In Kabbalah, there's a sphere that's called Tiferet, above the Yesod. In Kabbalah, this is explained, this is Yud Kevavke. When we pray to Hashem, we're actually praying to draw down this energy from this place called Tiferet. Below Yesod is Malchut. That's you. What is it that brings you Shefa from there? It's the Yesod. Now, our good friend here is mahavening to the fact that that's the tzaddik inside of you, and that's true. That when you tap into the tzaddik inside of you, which means the brit, that you're able to draw down only love, only joy, only energy, only heat from that place. But how do you ever get to the point that you mamish are you know, the brit? And there is only one way, but tzaddik is so wrong. I have no agenda. I'm not getting paid to tell you that. I am telling you explicitly that there is no possible way I would be in the place that I'm in today in that area if it was not for Rabbi Nachman and there's no other tzaddik in the world that can get me to stop wasting time. And I'm not the only one. There was 100,000 people in Uman like that that left that this past year. You want to say something? Do you think that, yeah. Do you think that... <laughs> say the truth. I think that Rabbi Nachman would tell you that's not the truth. I think Rabbi Nachman said the most important thing is Russia. I wouldn't agree with that at all. You're probably right. Well, what I relate with is that, you know, that the staff is definitely a rutzon. If you don't have a rutzon, then all of a sudden, even what, 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 what? So you need a rutzon. The rutzon is what made you change. Can I tell you something? I've had, is what I want to tell you, I want to tell you the truth. I've had a rutzon my whole life. You can have a real rutzon. So that's not a true. A real rutzon is, is what makes us. Connect with the tzaddik. Connect us. 
the rush zone is 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 that is opening up a small little procedure. Can you the pause the co- recording for a second? Put it on mute. Rhyme. Did anybody leave Mitzrayim who was not with Moshe? I'm asking you a simple question. Did anybody who did not have the vacant with Moshe leave Mitzrayim? No. Why is Moshe in the picture at all? Because Hashem chose him. Why? Because Mayar What does that mean? He was able to have eyes to go out and see his brother suffering. Why? Why? How about you not do that and just um, have increased, have a way that all the Jewish people can increase their will and leave Egypt? In another, in another, in humility. Okay. That that allowed him to lead the the people. But that's not Rotson. No, but that's why I chose Rotson. I understand that. Well, it's the highest level of growth. And it's making Hashem. So how come you're not? Moshe how come? Rabbeinu was a level of Isur Shdeleila. Isur Latata. Torah was a Isur Shdeleila. Speak in English. There's a there's the Kaz of Hasidus. There's a cause and awakening. Sometimes it's from above to below. Sometimes it's below to above. Shabbos above to below. You keep Shabbos. You're not still Shabbos in the world. The Kag is below to above. Torah, Moshe. That's a above from the Hashem chose Moshe, elevated him, and made him our Rabbeinu. Yes, he also deserved it, but it was because Hashem. Forget about deserve it. I'm not talking about Hashem deser- took us out. That was so, a so, so I'm life. not talking about deserving anything. Moshe Benu is was half a malach in his life. It's I'm not, I'm not speaking. I, I understand that. I agree with you, but I'm not speaking about deserving anything. I'm talking about the fact that there's a mitzvah called tzaddikim, and who was the one who had the most from Moshe? Who was the what? Who was the one who uh, who experienced the greatest benefit from Moshe? I feel. Yes, and who in particular? Joshua. And what, there's no question, he became the Redeemer. He literally was the Mashiach. He took the Jewish people to the land of Israel and he conquered the land, 100%. So the question is, what what, what about Yoshua? Yoshua had Ratzon. And then what did he do with he that Ratzon? He sat by his side, he sat by Moshe's side, he went, he was Moraglim, he was, he had Ratzon. And what did he do with that Ratzon? He nullified, he nullified himself to Moshe. 100%. That's the tzaddik. That's Ratzon, then tzaddik. No, no. 
it doesn't make a difference. You can have a Ratzon Stam, you can have a Ratzon for Hashem, you could be looking for Hashem your whole life, and you never find Him. You can you have think a, Hashem created a world of someone who really, really desires the biggest of Hashem, but doesn't have a tzaddik in their life that they will not be able to act with Hashem? Yes. I'm not hard to believe. I know that. I also did. <laughs> I think a tzaddik is so. I think it's so. Important. You can't say he's yeah, so. You can't. How do you, how do you get anything above your sod without a you sod? You You're saying you, how a, do you have a building? How do you have I'm a green. tenth floor without a foundation? Right. I a hundred percent agree with 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 the concept of tzaddik and having tzaddikas and having a tzaddik, a living one and a dead one. Okay, I believe in all the tzaddikim. I'm, I'm a big. I'm a big. Tzaddikim. What does it mean? Tzaddikim. What does it? Okay. I believe that Rotson comes first. And what does it? What does it mean to believe in tzaddikim? I think the reason why Hashem created again, Kater again, over again. What does his... it mean to believe in Tzaddik? What does that mean? It's a, it's a big conversation in itself. It's a very simple conversation. It's a very simple conversation. Yeah. What shows the degree to which you believe in Tzaddik? It's very simple. I'm simplifying it because I don't want this to be science or math. I want this to be very, very <laughs> simple. So Bezrat Hashem for the rest of the year. You can go work towards the truth for yourself so that you experience all the good in your life. It's Tzadik is supposed to be a kind of to Hashem to elevate you. What does it mean to believe in Tzadik? To listen to them. It's so simple. What does it mean that you listen to them? And then, and then what do you do through your listening? You do what they say. You do what they say. You do what they say. It's very, very, very simple. I agree with that. Okay, so therefore, even though you need a rut zone to be able to do that, who infuses you with the rut zone to go all the way? What is it that awakens you to actually mamish want to take on the hardest test of all mankind, which is to overcome the birth? Only the tzaddik can do that. You cannot will yourself to be shmir at the birth. Can I talk? Can I, can we're I say saying something? the same thing. No, we're not. You're just not realizing. I mean, we're just we're, we're different. Is that you're not going to end up sitting by the the thadik. You're not going to have connected with the thadik if you don't have that innate rutzon. I agree with you. <clears throat> innate rutzon. But that's that's it. Whatever, call it innate. Call whatever you want. No, but whatever rutzon. the rutzon is, that can't. That's not the end. You need to want. That's true. But that, is, But then what? Can I, can I you need to actualize it. You need a How do you do that? Okay, that's all we're saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. No, but <laughs> that's not what you're saying. That's what I'm saying. You're saying you just said before that you don't need a person. You just said that. You do need a tzaddik in your life, but you, the most the first prerequisite is you need rutzon. That, sure, that's what okay. is the most important thing. If you have rutzon, then so you again you keep shoot. saying that Rabbi Nachman says the most important thing. He does not say that. In all of his teachings, the a core thing is that you believing in yourself. Believing you saw in it rutzon, inside. I have not seen it inside. Okay, so I'm telling you it's not true. Doesn't he say there's many teachings that he says and he speaks about them. Even in Kabbalah, he speaks very, okay, great. That's wonderful. But I, I'm sure everybody here wants to grow. Does everybody here want to take a leap this year? Do you want your family life to take a leap this year? Do you want your job to take a leap this year? Do you want your spiritual life to take a leap this year? So I'm coming across the country for nothing. You're not giving me nothing. And I'm telling you the secret, and it's very, very, very simple. I'm just being flat out honest with you. Brit ish. It's the Brit. And your ability to conquer the Brit, which is not just not wasting seed, but to elevate everything in your physical life and make it spiritual, is the degree to which you're attached to the one who did that. And he's called the Tzadik. And he's called Moshe. He arisa like Adosh says that Moshe Rabbeinu comes down every jubilee. And he's called the Tzadik Adur. That whoever is the Tzadik of the generation, he is a manifestation of that soul of Moshe. He is the master of the world. Is that like a live shear or something? Yeah. You can't see us. Getting more depressed, more anxious, more confused, even though I felt tremendous life and joy from it. How is that possible that my whole life around me was falling apart despite the fact that I was listening to speakers giving over Rabbi Nachman's lesson? Anyone want to guess? Yes, yes.
I didn't actually do what he says to do. I didn't actually do what Alan he says to do. I didn't actually learn Torah with Koach. I didn't actually play with all my bones. And yet I'm learning it and it's so gishmak and my rut zone was so intense. Nobody has a greater rut zone than me. And yet my life was falling apart. So I'm just making it very, very simple. You need to take your tremendous rut zone and you need to dig, dip, dip it into a mix. You need to dip it into a mix that always you work you need to find yourself a time. And if you don't have one, that's normal. You need to pray to Hashem that you should be able to find one. And somebody will tell me, well, what about my rabbi? Also, this is not so normal. But the reason it makes it very clear is there is one motion in every generation. He's called the Tzadik Tama. He's the master of the birth. And it's his koach to be able to get to the place if you actualize all of your potential and make it in. economic, family, spiritual, everything. Everything. The question is why would Hashem do that? We're not Christian. We don't believe that a person is God. Nobody believes that Moshe is anything more than a person. He just reached an incredibly high level. And the answer is, what would it, what would have to happen for you to be able to listen to another person in your life, no matter what he says? Regardless of your family circumstances, no matter what your economic circumstances, no matter what, what would you have to do in order to listen to those things? What's the answer? Beautiful. Thank you. That's the only answer. You would have to be humble. What does the Torah say explicitly? What does the Chazal say explicitly? Is the thing which disconnects us from Hashem. Gava. That Hashem can't stand in the same place as a person who is arrogant. But there is only one litmus test for humility. Do you listen to something that's greater than you? I know for me, what I did was I took from Chassidus, I took from Torah what I liked. And the stuff that I felt like didn't fit, I didn't do. That was my whole beginning of my Jew, my Jew of all journey. But the transformation in my life came when I said, instead of me doing 10 minutes a day of Hippo to do it, and instead of uh, learning a little bit, instead of me uh, not just wasting seed, but also not watching things and not seeing things, that I said to myself, you know what? If this is real, then it's actually real. And if it's actually real, and I'm already invested in it, let me see how real it is. And I'm going to go and see if I could do and run the gamut. And I started to follow everything that one side accepted. And this was the beginning of the complete transformation in my life. And that is called, called Shmir of the Birth. There is no other way to keep the birth. And this is Bereshi Barlokim. And by the way, the Rizal says, where was Moshe Rabbeinu in the time of Adam Arisha? If we're saying that you need it, it's so fundamental, it's so great, so where was he in the time of Adam? Why would Hashem create without him? What do you want to say? Where was Moshe then? Where's the Tzaddik? If we're saying that the Tzaddik is the key to Adam, a person, a Jew, being close to Hashem and actualizing all the potential in his life, so Moshe should be there from the beginning. Where's Moshe? He's an Adam. I don't care all the same. Do you notice that in the beginning of Bereshit, they talk about a light, that Hashem created a light with Adam saw from one end of the world to the other, and then he hid it. And then there was Tov Bohu, and then he brought a little bit of it. Yehiwa, there was light. Does anybody notice in the next Sefer, Shemot, the same exact process happens, not with some type of spiritual light, but with a person. His name is Moshe. Then Moshe is born. He's hidden away in a teva. And then when the time is ripe, after the Jewish people are in slavery in Tov Bohu, Moshe is revealed. Because Moshe the Tzaddik is the manifestation of that light in actuality. He's the Tzaddik. He's that light from the seven days of creation. It's that light with which Adam saw from one end of the world to the other. And when we went into exile, what was the cause? We ate from the tree. And what does Rabbeinu teach in Lukut Naran? And what does Chazal teach uh, Achila is? It's a code word for 
Pagama Brit. So because of the blemish of the Brit, the light of Moshe went away. How do we get it back? Same way it went out. The only way to kosher a pot is the same way it got unkosher. How does a pot get unkosher? That you cook something that's not kosher with fire. How does it come out? Torch that puppy. You have to torch it, but from Kedusha. Same thing works with the Brit. How can I overcome the Brit if it's Mamish fire, if it's Brit Ish? Only with fire. What does that fire look like? Torah that's fire. Tefillah that's fire. Ibotah do that's fire. That your whole avoda in your life is fire. And if you make your spiritual life on fire, you can have the bird ish. And this is the whole Iker Rabbi Nachman's teaching. That you pray with koach, that your bones are shaking as you're praying, that you're waking up and you're doing one hour Ibotah do and you're crying and you're begging and you're pleading Hashem. That if anybody saw the way that you prayed, they would be terrified. I was in the woods in my back of my house uh, over the COVID. I went to my parents' house. My wife was going crazy. I said, let's go to my parents' house. You know, we have three kids, Baruch Hashem. They have a bigger space. I'm sure my parents love to see us. And there was woods in the backyard. So this is great. I don't have woods where I am. I live in Queens. So my parents are not necessarily connected to these concepts. And um, I said, they know I do something called Ibotadu, but they don't know that in my Ibotadu, what I'm doing. So I said, like, I need to have a place that I talk to Hashem. So they go, okay, so you go here and here. I said, Rabbi Nachman says it's better to do it in nature. So I go back in the back of the woods. And, you know, 20 minutes, 40 minutes, I'm clapping, I'm screaming, I'm crying, I'm singing to Hashem. I'm thanking Hashem for everything in my life. I'm talking about the things that I'm struggling with. I'm begging Him for help in every area of my life financially, spiritually, uh, relationally, every aspect of my life, I'm begging and pleading Hashem for help. I did this for a few days, and I had some geschmacky bodhi session. And then all of a sudden, somebody comes out of the woods, and he says, keep your hands where you see them. I said, okay. Comes in, he's got his ranger outfit on. And he says, what are you doing here? <laughs> I said, um... I'm talking to God. <laughs> and he said, uh, Yeah. <laughs> he goes, uh, What you saying to you? He goes, Uh huh, uh huh. And he goes, Why? And he goes, and, and you're dancing and singing while you're doing that? I said, Yeah. 